I have to deal with item number eight, which is EU scrutiny for the public record. Um, the committee have agreed that scheduled B items COM 2019-9 and COM 2019-10 and scheduled A items COM 2018-892 and COM 2018-900 do not warrant further scrutiny. Uh, full details will be published on the committee's website. Uh, today I would like to welcome uh, Justice Mary Lefoy and your colleagues uh, to this meeting. Um, the meeting will deal with the accountability in banking and banking um, and before we go into the meeting proper I want to advise the witnesses that by virtue of section 17.2i of the Defamation Act 2009 witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. If you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise nor make charges against a person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or, or it identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make them identifiable. And can I now invite Justice Foy to make your opening remarks, please. Thank you very much. Um, Chair, members of the Committee, uh, on behalf of the Commission, I want to thank you for inviting us here today to discuss um, our recent report on regulatory powers and corporate offences. And um, it was published last October, um, and I was appointed President of the Commission last October, so I have had no hand actor part in this particular work. Uh, but I'm joined today by uh, my two colleagues on the Commission, um, Raymond Byrne and Tom O'Malley, and uh, th they will uh, take uh, questions from you when we have completed the opening statement. As well as that, I have uh, accompanying me today um, Kieran Burke, who is the Director of Research, Robert Noonan, who is the Deputy Director of Research, and two of the principal legal uh, re researchers on the project, that's Leanne Caulfield and Morgan Herve. And uh, Raymond Byrne is going to present the, the opening statement. Raymond. Thank you, uh, th thank you Chair, and Chair and members of the committee. And, um, I, I'll just begin by uh, uh, making a point about the Commission. We are a research uh, and advisory body, we're a statutory body, and uh, even though in our title it says law reform, of course we can't do actual law reform, so this is a matter for yourselves as legislators, and we're particularly happy and delighted that you've taken an interest in this particular report in the context of your discussion on accountability in banking. And we're also very conscious that uh, this committee has previously taken a great interest in the work of the Commission, most recently in the uh, detailed scrutiny that you carried out on the consumer uh, insurance bill, which uh, was related to the uh, previous work of, of the Commission. So we very much thank you for the great interest that you've already shown in our work. And uh, as you know, we try and include either draft bills or schemes of bills in our reports, which we hope uh, the uh, government and the Oireachtas uh, will find helpful. We very much emphasise uh, in the uh, written opening statement that we have, and I won't go through all of that um, given the time constraints uh, today, but we do take very seriously the uh, consultative process both in terms of how we put together programmes of law reform under which we carry out most of our work and in the consultative process uh, on the fourth programme of law reform, uh, both the issue of uh, the powers of financial and economic regulators uh, and then the related issue of corporate criminal liability in both areas that a lot of our consultees uh, indicated was important in terms of examining uh, that area. And of course we recognise that the committee is particularly focused on financial services and the role of the central bank. In the consultations that we held in relation to the fourth programme, um, other regulators were also mentioned as being important in terms of systemic risks to uh, the state uh, that might arise in the future. So our report includes not just uh, 
issues relating to the central bank and its powers, but also other sectoral economic regulators on which uh, we note that there have been a number of policy documents, including the 2013 document on regulating for a better future and then the 2017 document on measures to improve Ireland's accountability in relation to the issue of financial and economic regulation and white-collar crime, as it's sometimes described. Uh, as I say, um, we take uh, consultation uh, very uh, much uh, as an important part of our work and we get a huge amount of input uh, in that respect from uh, government offices, uh, uh, relevant interested parties and NGOs in the analysis that, that we carry out and that was certainly the case in, in the case of this particular report including in the context of the 2016 annual conference that we um, focused on this particular uh, area and we heard from a number of national and international speakers with expertise both in terms of regulatory powers and also uh, in the context of corporate criminal liability. We recognise that in the choices that we make uh, in a report, there are a number of possible options that we could take in relation to many of the issues, the complex issues that we look at, and we're very conscious that this, of course, is a matter then that must be moved on to the uh, government and the Oireachtas in terms of the final decision about whether to implement the recommendations of the Commission. In terms of the background to this report and the context for why the Commission examined it, of course the banking crisis that emerged in 2008 uh, and the um, activities of uh, banks uh, that led up to that, um, that, that was certainly a context and we were very conscious as well, of course, that there have been a number of studies done, notably by the banking inquiry that was carried out in the houses of the Oireachtas. So we look at that in terms of the way in which we analysed the issues that needed to be addressed. And we're also very conscious then in terms of some of what uh, the former governor of the central bank, Patrick Honahan, described as egregiously reckless risk taking. We recognise that there were issues that needed to be identified in order to examine uh, what further reforms might be needed. We acknowledge, of course, that there have been quite a number of significant changes enacted uh, since 2008, both at national level here in the Oireachtas and at EU level in terms of the single supervisory mechanism. But we also note in our report that a number of reforms that had previously been made, for example, in the Theft and Fraud Offences Act 2001, had been used and were used effectively in the context of criminal prosecutions. Now, we, we don't propose and we don't comment on particular cases or the outcome uh, of particular cases, but we just note that in the, in the report. In terms of some of the key recommendations, and there are uh, over 200 recommendations, and I'm uh, uh, informed by our maths experts in the, in the research uh, team that it's in fact 202 recommendations, but I won't go through all of those 202 recommendations, so we're just focusing on a number of them. The proposal for a corporate crime agency, to what extent financial and economic regulators have sufficient uh, powers in their regulatory toolkit and in particular to make uh, and impose significant financial sanctions and make regulatory enforcement agreements or settlements. Um, the issue of egregiously reckless risk taking and what reforms might be done in the criminal law in that area and then the role that deferred prosecution agreements are in effect, in effect suspension of criminal prosecutions to what extent those deferred prosecution agreements or DPAs might have a role to play in the overall context of ensuring accountability. In looking at the first of those proposals, the Corporate Crime Agency, we're very conscious that the government's paper on measures to enhance Ireland's corporate economic and regulatory framework published in 2017, that made a number of important recommendations uh, and some of which are being uh, acted on now. So one of those is the establishment of the Corporate Enforcement Authority as a replacement of the Office of the Director of Corporate Enforcement as a separate uh, entity rather than a unit within the uh, parent department. Now, the Commission's proposal on a corporate crime agency is separate from that um, in that the proposal of the Commission is that this would be a body that would have power to engage in prosecutions that don't fall within the regulatory remit of any of the regulators uh, that we looked at, whether the Central Bank, the Competition and Consumer Protection Commission, Comreg, 
uh, or the proposed Corporate Enforcement Authority. The Corporate Enforcement Authority would, in the bill that's uh, under uh, legislative scrutiny at the moment, be limited to enforcement of the Companies Act 2014. Uh, the proposal of the Commission would be that this uh, uh, Corporate Crime Agency would have a wider remit. Uh, we understand from the legislative detail, legislative scrutiny that, that has been carried out um, earlier on this month uh, in another committee uh, on the Corporate Enforcement Authority Bill that the um, review group on anti-fraud and anti-corruption structures is uh, engaged in a review of that particular recommendation of the Commission and that we understand that that group is to make its recommendations later this year. The associated proposal in the Commission's report was that there ought to be a, a continuation of the dedicated unit on corporate crime that has already been established in the Office of the Director of um, Pro Public Prosecutions, uh, particularly that dealt with the prosecutions uh, post-2008. And the Commission recommends that that unit should, of course, be continued uh, in place and that it work, work, work closely with the proposed corporate crime agency. I think it's important that the committee be aware that the Commission in its report recommended very strongly that based on past experience that uh, was identified in the report with poorly resourced agencies, both the Corporate Crime Agency as proposed and this dedicated union, unit in the Director of Public Prosecution's office should be properly and fully resourced. This is a matter that's outside of the uh, remit of the Commission. We can't carry out that kind of economic analysis of what kind of uh, resources would be required, but that is certainly something that the Commission uh, emphasised in, in the report. In terms, uh, moving on then to the kind of regulatory powers that would uh, involve a full set of regulatory toolkit powers for financial and economic regulators, I won't go through all of the um, powers that are mentioned there, but of the six core powers that we mention, in particular, we talk about the power to impose administrative financial sanctions, and we emphasise that in order to ensure that that would meet constitutional requirements, that that must be subject to court oversight and approval. And this would be very similar to the central bank's current powers um, in terms of what could be imposed as a maximum sanction for companies of 10 million euro and or 10% of turnover and a maximum sanction for individuals of 1 million euro. And in addition to that, that all financial and economic regulators should have the power to enter into regulatory compliance agreements or settlements, and this would include the power to impose financial sanctions, to have put in place consumer redress schemes and agreements to put in place corporate compliance policies. And you'll be aware, of course, that the central bank already has those powers. We make some recommendations in terms of how we think those powers of the central bank could be improved, in particular in terms of the process for investigation. But we also recommend that other regulators, such as the Competition Commission and Comreg, which do not have those powers, we recommend that they should have those powers. As I say, we make some recommendations in relation to the particular process by which inquiries are conducted by the central bank and we think that those could be uh, improved from an efficiency point of view comparable to the process that is uh, put in place for, for example, the Medical Council's fitness to practice process. Turning then to the question of the criminal law and its use in this context, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the former governor of the central bank referred to the need to have in place appropriate criminal law enforcement mechanisms to deal with egregiously reckless risk taking. The Commission examined two uh, related aspects of that. To what extent should the Theft and Fraud Offences Act of 2001 be amended and whether there was a case to be made for the introduction of an offence specifically called reckless trading. Um, in relation to this issue, the Commission came to the conclusion that it would be appropriate to amend the Theft and Fraud Offences Act to provide that uh, there should be an explicit reference to recklessness in that context. So that would mean, for example, in the context of, of the offence of false accounting in the 2001. This would occur not only where the accounts were fabricated knowingly and intentionally, and that would be the current law, but also where this was done with subjective recklessness. That is, where the defendant consciously disregarded a risk that the victim would be deceived by the false accounting. Uh, because of the recommendations that the Commission made in relation to uh, the 2001 Act, the Commission <coughs> concluded in its chapter dealing with reckless trading that it would not be appropriate to put in place an offence of reckless trading on the basis that this would either be an offence that would not in practice be enforceable or else it would have a potentially chilling effect on legitimate risk-taking. That, that was the conclusion of, of the Commission. 
In relation to the other aspect of powers uh, in relation to criminal prosecution, the Commission examined whether uh, we should introduce a statutory deferred prosecution agreement arrangement. Uh, and that is a procedure where a prosecution can be suspended or put in abeyance by the prosecution pending compliance with and subject to compliance with strict conditions set out in the deferred prosecution agreement itself, which would be a published uh, document, not something that would be done in private. The Commission recommends that there is a case to be made for introducing deferred prosecution agreements subject to the control of the Director of Public Prosecutions who would work closely with financial and economic regulators in determining whether a DPA was suitable in a particular case. And we recommended that the model that's been introduced since 2013 in the UK uh, under legislation, which requires court approval for any proposed DPA, that that would be the preferred model. There is a DPA model in the United States that you will probably be very familiar with, but that is uh, that has no statutory basis. It is not uh, subject to court approval and it is that at the discretion of a relevant prosecutor. So the Commission concluded that that would not be an appropriate model. Another issue that arises in the context of criminal uh, law and the corporate liability context is the issue of due diligence. And you might be glad to know that this is the last of the main issues that I'm uh, addressing to, to the Committee. Uh, but the Commission recommends that for most corporate offences of a regulatory type, it would be appropriate uh, to have in place a due diligence defence. That is a defence which shows that um, where an organisation has set up suitable risk management procedures, that would be a defence. Um, and if they haven't got in place suitable risk management policies and procedures, then that would mean that there would be a conviction. The purpose of this approach is to fit with the approach that's taken by a lot of the regulators, which is to encourage organisations to put in place the resources required in order to have sufficient risk management and risk appetite, whether it's in the context of financial services or any other aspect of economic activity that a corporate entity would be engaged in. So the Commission considers uh, that looking at all of the literature in this area, it would be appropriate to have that in place for most of the regulatory type offences uh, that regulators are responsible for. They would not be appropriate as a defence in a fraud offence, because a fraud offence would either involve intentional behaviour or knowing behaviour, or if the Commission's recommendations were to be implemented, reckless behaviour. And so it would be completely illogical and inconsistent to say, well, if you've got policies and procedures to stop yourself from uh, carrying out something intentionally, that that could be a defence. We also recommend that in the context of organisations taking legal advice, that could be taken account but only at a sentencing, as a sentencing issue, that that would not in itself be a defence to a prosecution. And similarly in the context of another related issue, sometimes referred to as officially induced error, the question is to whether if a regulator in the financial and economic area uh, gave advice which seemed to indicate that uh, everything was in compliance with the legislation, to what extent that would be a defence. Uh, this is something that the Commission said would have to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case or factual basis if the facts of the situation uh, established that there was a so-called officially induced error in which it was reasonable to rely on the advice of a regulator and that advice was authoritative and clearly applied in the particular situation, then that would uh, either be a kind of a defence or would prevent a prosecution from uh, proceeding. And we note just briefly that the Supreme Court in a decision last Thursday appeared to indicate that, that such a defence would be available in an appropriate case, uh, but in the particular circumstances of that case it did not uh, apply. In conclusion, um, uh, what we have tried to do in the report is to take account of international best practice insofar as we could see that in the review of literature that the research team carried out on behalf of the Commission in developing the report that was published last October. What that international literature, whether from the OECD or EU or those who have uh, expertise in this area, have indicated that in particular uh, administrative financial sanctions and the power to enter into regulatory settlements are key parts of a good regulatory toolkit. Um, and on the criminal law, the Commission recommends that the reforms proposed in the report, while not in any sense guaranteeing that the issues that have arisen in the past can be prevented in the future, but that they could play a, an element of deterrence in terms of the risk-taking that Governor Honahan referred to previously. Of course, we recognise that all of 
these recommendations are a matter for the government and the Oireachtas, including this committee, to determine whether they ought to be implemented. And uh, again, uh, on behalf of the Commission, uh, we very much welcome your interest in this area and we're very happy to take any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Byrne. Uh, Senator Conway Welsh. Sorry, just, um, Deputy Darty. Deputy Darty first. Yeah, um, from Igat, uh, Chairperson, and um, I want to welcome you to, to the committee and, and thank you for your publication on this issue and on, on numerous other pieces of, of work. Um, and you mentioned the insurance contracts bill, which I'm the sponsor of, and indeed. Um, is a very very simple given that the bill is drafted by the Law Reform Commission and only required a number of tweaks to update it with relevant um, legislation that has passed since its publication uh, and hopefully the committee will see that uh, progressing through um, a, a, at a future point. I, I want to ask um, in relation to your approach to some of the, 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 the matters that you raised, um, and I'll start with the issue of reckless lending, which is another piece of legislation that I have before, um, before the House of the Rockers. Um Your approach is that an amendment to the Theft and Frauds Offences Act is sufficient as opposed to um, a standalone piece of legislation, or a standalone offence in, in terms of reckless lending. Um, and I, I, I don't understand, and I've listened to what you've said there, but I don't understand the approach that you've taken there. Can you explain to me, um, for example, does there need to be a victim in, in relation to um, the, if the offence that you suggest was introduced, would there also need to be a victim um, if it was a theft or fraud, fraud offences? Um, and can you just explain again why you didn't go with what Britain has gone for what Australia has gone for, what the former governor of the central bank has gone for or suggested, which was that reckless lending in itself be an offence as opposed to added to uh, an amendment to the theft and frauds offences. First question. I, I can certainly start to answer that, um, uh, and I'm sure Commissioner O'Malley will probably fo follow on in, in terms of, of that particular issue. In, in relation to the amendment to the 2001 Act, it wouldn't be necessary, and I, uh, you, you can see in the opening statement I did refer to a victim, but it isn't necessary to be the case that an actual loss would actually have to occur in, the, in relation to the way in which the current offence is, is defined. So uh, deception doesn't necessarily have to involve, uh, so it's the potential for a, a loss. So particularly in the context that might arise in the context of activities uh, where it couldn't be established that there was a loss. But what I was uh, indicating in the context of the amendments would be that in relation to what might be defined as deception for that purposes, it would be uh, uh, sufficient to establish that there was this conscious disregard of that risk of causing a loss uh, or creating a profit, uh, that that would be sufficient in order to establish a defence. Uh, in relation to uh, the uh, provisions in both the UK and Australia, which the Commission examined in detail, and of course we recognise that uh, former Governor Honehan was uh, suggesting that the UK uh, provision which was uh, an offence of engaging in a sense in reckless activity that might cause a bank to fail and was specifically focused on, uh, on a banking failure. Uh, the Commission examined that in detail. Now in terms of the, the, the detail of that offence, it would appear that there would be a very high burden on the prosecution in order to establish how it could be that a particular act or a series of acts perhaps by senior managers within a bank actually caused that bank to fail. That, that was one of the aspects that the Commission felt was a particularly high burden uh, in the context of that particular offence. It may very well be that that offence would be suitable, but in the analysis that the Commission carried out, it felt that uh, the uh, burden on the prosecution would be quite a high burden. In relation to the Australian offence, there, there certainly is an offence that describes itself as reckless trading. It would appear that in practice in Australia, so far as that provision is used, it really is related to situations where there is intention, intentional or knowing fraud. So uh, although it appears to be addressing the, the question of reckless trading, in, in practice it appeared 
to the Commission insofar as we could see what was happening in Australia, it appeared to be related to intention or knowing uh, behaviour. Uh, and that was why, in a sense, we came back to looking at the 2001 Act, which is quite wide in scope uh, and therefore would address quite a lot of issues obviously in the banking context, but also in wider contexts where there, uh, you, you might not be necessarily talking about a banking failure. So that, that, that was the analysis. Can I put it into probably just our past experience, and obviously we're dealing with future laws, so it can't be applied past, so I'm just saying that in case I'm suggesting anything that I'm not. But I would say the majority of the public out there believe that what happened in Anglo-Irish Bank was reckless and reckless lending. I just say the layperson believes that. I sh certainly believe that. Mm. Uh, I also understand that we don't have any law against that in terms of reckless lending in itself. So therefore, you can't suggest it was a crime, right? Because it's not, there's no law against it. Now, with the definition that the Law Reform Commission are putting forward in terms of, you know, conscious objective recklessness, would that be sufficient to ensure that if we had a repeat by whoever, whatever institution, of the activities that we had in Anglo, for example, that individuals could be prosecuted. Because I think that's the test that I definitely would put to any, um, any insertion of reckless lending into a piece of primary legislation. Could we prosecute? Could we jail the bankers if they continue to do what they did in the past, if they did that in the future? Because, in my view, and I've said it to some of them, they should have been jailed for what they've done. You know, but it wasn't a crime, and that's our fault. That's the fault of the establishment, the fault of people who didn't pass laws to, to make such, those actions a crime. So as we're dealing with now making these things crime, in your view, would that allow for prosecution of individuals if such a uh, scenario were to unfold in the future, as happened in the past. I, and I, I think I, I will certainly ask uh, Commissioner O'Malley to, to talk about this, uh, but if, if I can say just very briefly, I suppose the, the Commission doesn't generally uh, comment on particular or, or in individual cases, but we've certainly noted in the report that uh, a, a number of situations did arise where prosecutions under the existing law, which requires intention or knowledge, did lead to convictions. What, what we certainly are suggesting, and it would be very difficult to predict always exactly how a law would work out, but we would certainly say that it would be useful to uh, include in the definition of what amounts to fraudulent activity, to include what perhaps um, uh, even in the criminal law uh, and in the understanding of the criminal law quite often the concept of subjective recklessness is included as part of the, this mental element or mens rea of offences. So while it is impossible to predict exactly what might happen in the future, the Commission felt that it would be appropriate to include that concept of subjective recklessness. So the word recklessness and the word reckless would by definition then be included. Uh, in uh, the offence and in the mental element of the offence. But I, I know uh, Commissioner O'Malley would be much more able to talk about the detail of, of that. Well, I would agree uh, with that. I mean, simply, I mean, one comment I would make, uh, I suppose, when you analyse uh, a lot of the cases that have happened, that have come before the courts here and elsewhere, and of course, you know, there have been quite a number of prosecutions. Uh, in arising from the matter that you mentioned uh, over the years, and that is that it can be quite difficult to affix responsibility to individuals within organisations. That, that is one of the problems, that if you have, if responsibility is diffused, as by necessity it will in a very large organisation, whether it's a commercial organisation, whether it's a public organisation or whatever, it can be quite difficult, if you like, uh, as we discovered very often, to affix blame uh, to anybody, even to, even to to be able to affix sufficient suspicion to them to, to justify a prosecution to begin with. Um, but I, I think that, as Commissioner Byrne has said, um, perhaps the best way forward, and as, you know, th there's no kind of magic solution to this, but the best way forward is probably by including uh, recklessness as uh, a sufficient mental element for the crime. In other words, if the law as it now stands uh, 
requires the prosecution to prove that a person acted intentionally, which means that it was their specific purpose to bring about a specific result, or knowingly in the sense that they knew exactly what they were doing and that they still intended to bring about the result. If it is brought out to include recklessness, well then it does impose a higher standard of care or it imposes a higher level of responsibility on them uh, to ensure that they don't take unjustified risks because that's what recklessness is essentially is about. It's about the taking of unjustified risks. And I suppose the word unjustified is very, very important there because, again, as, as Commissioner Byrne pointed out in his opening statement, one of the big challenges that we have to meet uh, and that everybody has to um, address this kind of, when it comes to corporate regulation, is to strike an appropriate balance between, on the one hand, encouraging enterprise and encouraging legitimate risk-taking, and on the other hand, of course, then to ensure that any kind of wrong, wrongdoing is absolutely outlawed. So hopefully the kind of concept of recklessness that we're recommending would, I would think, at least uh, strike an appropriate balance and it would certainly be well worth, um, I would think, considering by the legislature. Why in the Theft and Fraud Offences Act? Because the Theft and Fraud Offences Act are an act that has victims at the other side of them. In terms of recklessness within banking, you may not have a victim at that point. What, why did I originally have it? Yeah. You, won't ha you may not have a victim at that point. The victim is down the road. The, this is about making sure that the type of activity where we had in the past, where you know bankers were lending billions of euro to individuals which were you know already overstretched, mm. uh, that they had high concentration in certain portfolios. And they were doing that because their, 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 the value to, to shares was increasing, their bonus, were, there was an incentive to do that. But there was no victim at that point in time. That's true, yeah. So therefore you could not prosecute them. Uh, and I have a concern in relation to recklessness to being added to uh, our, our, our toolbox um, in the context of threat, theft and fraud, that you're narrowing the scope in relation to having to identify a victim in relation to their activity as opposed to the conduct of the individual in terms of their recklessness, whether there is a victim at that point or not. Like the whole intention here should be to try and ensure that there is no victim, you know, at, at, at a point in time. It's the conduct of the individual. Uh, well, I think it probably could still, um, it could, it could still function because it should be, I mean, first of all, right in saying that there doesn't need to be a victim because very often when it comes to <coughs> deception offences, for example, they're so defined that a person commits a deception offence if they engage in certain conduct to make a gain for themselves or for another or to cause loss to somebody. So, you know, the wrongfully seeking to make a gain for yourself, even if there's no identifiable victim there, uh, would still fall within the definition, come within the definition of these particular offences. And therefore, if they do that, um, I mean, the recklessly would be if you like, as to the uh, nature of the conduct of which they're engaging. But I suppose in relation to the question as to why it didn't, um, wh why it's not there already in a sense, or why uh, about the, the adequacy of the Theft and Fraud Offences Act, I suppose you're talking about a piece of legislation that came in, dates from 2001, based as it happens on another report of this commission dating from the 1990s, at a time, I suppose, when it was not, when, when, I suppose, the kind of thing that happened with the collapse of the system in 2007, 2008 probably wasn't even remotely contemplated. And therefore, the question is, uh, are the offences that are in the Act adequate for that, uh, adequate to deal with this kind of purpose? Um, as I say, there are other, um, clearly other uh, issues or other uh, proposals we have made which had to be taken into account as well in the sense that very often, as I said already, it's a question of who could actually be prosecuted for them. And I think particularly relevant in this context are the, um, way in, the ways in which companies, for example, can be uh, found criminally, li criminally liable. And I think they, that the um, recommendations that we're making in that regard are equally important uh, to ensure that there is, for the first time ever, if this, uh, these recommendations are adopted, that there are fairly clear rules there as to the circumstances of which a company, as well as an individual, uh, can be held guilty of a criminal offence. You say, just going on to accountability under the liability of corporate management agents, you say that 
a managerial agent shall be liable and prosecuted on the same basis as if he or she were guilty of a corporate offence. Now, if you're guilty of a corporate offence, you're, you're, it's administrative sanctions. Is this, a, is this a criminal sanctions that you're suggesting, that the, these individuals, it's not necessarily the same as a corporate offence because you can't send a bank to jail, you know? So is there a difference here or is there a, a limitation in relation to how similar uh, they can be prosecuted? Sorry, so you say, that... you say that an individual, an agent, a managerial agent can yes. be, can be um, let me see, can be, uh, shall be liable to be prosecuted on the same basis if, if yes. he or she were guilty of a corporate offence. So does that, is what you're proposing that individuals could be, could be sent to jail as a result of, of, of prosecution or is it in relation to just uh, sanctions that could be implied on them? Well, uh, if you're talking about the situation where, let's say, both an officer of the company yeah. could be prosecuted, or an officer broadly construed, could be company could be prosecuted, as well as the company itself. I mean, the the one doesn't exclude the other. Um, and in fact, already um, we have a situation, many statutes, whereby uh, individuals can be prosecuted uh, in addition to the companies to which they actually belong. Um, I suppose what our recommendations do is that they would um, essentially clarify that, uh, putting into law quite clearly that yes, it is possible for uh, agents, for senior managers of a company to be held personally, personally liable in addition to the company itself. Uh, Isn't that like what you're proposing um, is is a lot weaker than what the central bank is proposing. Would that not be the case? And the central bank made a submission to the Law Reform Commission, and indeed the central bank then, through uh, the scandal in the, the trackers, have, have outlined their senior management, um, how, how individuals could be kept to account, basically mirror what is already in place and in law in Britain for the last two to three years, where they would have to map out the area of responsibilities that they have, and no longer would they be allowed to rely on the defence that they were not aware uh, of, of conduct that happened under their, uh, their, their chain of, 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 of command. But the Law Reform Commission appears to be going for a very weaker version of individual accountability. Would it be correct or incorrect in saying that? If, 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 I, if I can uh, answer that, I think the, the, the two proposals actually complement each other in, in the sense that the senior management uh, type of proposal that the central bank made in the report last July, um, that is about uh, the extent to which under uh, a specific situation where uh, responsibility would be attached to a particular office holder, that that would involve also personal criminal liability. What the Commission would be proposing is something that would actually complement that in the sense that where an offence has been committed by the corporate entity, and this would certainly be in the context of criminal liability, then if it is the case that it can be identified, as Commissioner O'Malley has said, that a senior person within the organisation also was involved either um, uh, in terms of failing to take the kinds of uh, precautions that ought to have been put in place and that that contributed to the offence by the corporate entity, then you could also prosecute the, the senior person. So, in fact, these are complementary um, uh, proposals. Uh, and, and would that proposal also include the fact that if that, if that person, just say, let's say it was the CEO of, of, of the corporate entity um, who has responsibility, relied on the fact that it was somebody down the chain that, uh, that, that, that carried out or that missed uh, uh, something that they shouldn't have missed that allowed for the activity which is now prosecuted, been prosecuted if criminally yes. at a corporate level. Could the CEO rely on that defence or are you suggesting that what the central bank has said that they map out the areas of responsibility and therefore they do not have that defence anymore because it was their responsibility to be aware of what was happening below them? The, the short answer is yes, um, if, if, if I can give a very short answer. And I think the, the other aspect of this is that the Commission's proposal would also be something that would clarify, as Commissioner O'Malley has said, the potential for somebody to say 
uh, at a very senior level, oh, I didn't know what was going on further down, uh, the so-called defence that um, you know, if something goes wrong, deputy heads must roll. But in, in this particular instance, the proposal that the Commission would be making is that at all different levels of responsibility, there is a requirement that there be communication up and down so that, uh, for example, the senior management proposal that the central bank is proposing would identify particular roles and responsibilities. The Commission's proposal, which is related to what's so-called derivative liability or parasitic liability, would be saying that regardless of whether you have an identified role, if you have a senior policy-making function, whether you're called the CEO or the senior financial officer, uh, corporate financial officer, regardless of whether the central bank would impose a particular line of duty, those senior people within the organisation, if it can be shown that they have failed in their duties, then they can also be held personally accountable as well as the corporate entity. So they, the, the two of them actually are complementary to each other and the Commission's proposal in terms of derivative liability would ensure that supposing in a particular instance uh, everybody except the CEO has taken a particular role and responsibility. The CEO of the organisation would still, under the derivative liability proposals of the Commission, be held accountable, even if, for some reason, they had persuaded everybody else to take on particular roles uh, and the CEO had not taken on a particular role. So that responsibility of derivative liability would still apply in those circumstances. But, and I'll finish on this here. But is it not the case, and look, I appreciate that like, this, this, the recommendations that are being put forward from the Law Reform Commission um, add to our toolkit and strengthen our, our hand in relation to uh, ensuring uh, that either criminal activity within institutions or at an individual level uh, is able to be prosecuted and hopefully deter. Um, that being said, I still feel that they're quite weak. Um, and like, here you're talking about the individual accountability, but we are currently, as we stand, able to prosecute individual accountability for in, for individuals who should have done or should have noticed or should have raised alarm bells or whatever in, in relation to their specific functions within the financial institution. The problem, which I see it, and look, I'm only a lay person here, but is that the activities that they're doing are not illegal. You know, it kind of goes back to this here, that we have a banker before us and we're saying, we're kind of saying, well, you should have, you shouldn't have done that, you know. But there's nothing against the law for doing it. There's nothing. There was absolutely nothing wrong with the banker landing in at the hotel down the road and giving, you know, 230 million euro of a check to a developer without any proper scrutiny as to whether that was appropriate or not, or whether it would bust the bank. Or we're told that like a billion euro of money that has to be returned to individuals in the tracker scandal. Really, there was nothing wrong in it. You know, so the problem with holding individuals to account is we can hold them to account, but if we continue to say that the practices that is happening or could potentially happen in the future is okay, what's the point? Do you know what I mean? Like, so if the individual says up and it goes, yeah, I'm responsible for this. It was my call. And so what? Because it was an administrative error, and you know every bank made the same administrative error. But sure, that's just coincidence. Like there's, no, you know, and I'm not convinced. And, and maybe I'm, you know, as I say, I appreciate this is a step forward, but I'm not convinced. Looking at two of the major financial scandals that we have had to endure over the last decade, the collapse of some of our banks and how lending went on here. If these were, if this was implemented in law whether we'd have more, more bankers jailed as a result of their conduct, I don't think so. Or whether anybody would indeed have gone to prison or would even be sacked, because nobody's been sacked, indeed a number of them have been promoted within the banks because of the tracker scandal. So I'm not sure that this just cuts it. Uh, I, 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 I do appreciate that it gives extra teeth, but we're 10 years on from the scandal. Like this, this, and you know, it's the fact that we're actually ten years on, and we still haven't. We, we have changed laws, and we've increased regulation. And I, I you know, I've, I've no doubt about, it, about that. But we're still the fact that ten years on, we still haven't dealt with individual accountability within financial institutions screams loudly at what the establishment and how they are protecting institutions, in my view.
you know, I just I, I leave it at that. But I would like to hear your response and convince me that I'm wrong. You know, convince me that this is the this is the bee's knees, and you know, God help us that if we ever if went through what we were went through in the last decade, that at least there would be accountability, because that's what this is about, in my view. Commissioner Commissioner O'Malley would like to say a few words. Thank you. Well, I mean, it's, uh, you have made a very eloquent uh, uh, point there. I mean, I'm not saying this is the last word in terms of perhaps there are other criminal offences that could be uh, thought of, but I mean, one of the things that we always have to remember is that this gets down to, uh, you know, it's a very basic policy question uh, about this, the reach, to what extent do we wish the criminal law, or what reach do we wish the criminal law to have as opposed to other aspects of law? Because one of the things, one of the constraints that we're always operating under, and that the Iraqis is always operating under when it comes to defining new criminal offences, is that under the Constitution and under the European Convention of Human Rights, every criminal offence must be clearly and specifically defined. There must be, there is a right to fair labelling and fair warning, so that a person can know in advance precisely what is permitted by law and precisely what is uh, prohibited by law. So therefore any criminal offence that is, is created uh, must be sufficiently clearly defined so that a person can look at it in advance and say, well, if I do this, I'm within the law. If I, if I do this, I'm outside of the law. Now, I'm not suggesting that you know, what you're suggesting, Deputy, uh, or, or the kinds of issues you're raising could not be accommodated uh, you know, within uh, you know, a properly defined criminal offence. I'm just saying that that is one of the challenges uh, that will always have to be addressed. And it's purely a matter of fairness uh, as much as anything else. But if what I would just like to say, and perhaps this is maybe going back to the last point rather than the one you've just mentioned, is that I think in terms of general policy, um, in terms of deterring criminal conduct on the part of people working in the financial sector, which is really what we want to do, that the combination of the corporate offence and the personal liability that might attract, that might attach to individual officers and so on, should be quite effective. Now, I say should be quite effective, in the sense that obviously the only penalty that can be imposed on a corporate entity, in effect, is a, a financial penalty, is a fine. Whereas, of course, if you're dealing with human. Uh, defendants who are convicted of offences, well, then clearly the penalties can be much more onerous in terms of imprisonment and so forth. So one would hope that the combination of those two, the fact that a, a company may be very severely punished uh, in terms of a financial penalty, the fact that individual individuals within the company may find themselves suffering deprivation of liberty as well as deprivation of property, uh, should it, the combination of these two, I would suggest, should be fairly effective. Thanks, uh, Deputy Director. Senator Conor Welch. Uh, and thank you for your opening statement and indeed for the work uh, that you're doing around this. I think we all want to get to the same place. Uh, I suppose the overriding question uh, for me is, uh, do you think that what you have here uh, fills the gap, um, say, between this state and Iceland, where we saw 27, was it, bankers jailed? So are you satisfied that that would enable the same thing to happen here? And have you looked at, I suppose, Iceland in terms of what they had that we didn't have that facilitated that? It, it, there's no doubt in, in different countries uh, the issues to as to individual accountability has been dealt with differently. Um, in, in terms of proportions, uh, you could say that there are different proportions uh, by comparison between Ireland and Iceland. On the other hand, there have been a number of significant prosecutions and convictions. Uh, and certainly from the point of view of where we all want to be, what the Commission recognised in, in looking at this very, very wide-ranging issue was that uh, there was that issue of around corporate liability and personal liability of senior managers, and then also in particular the kinds of tools that regulators in the financial and economic sector need in order to have effective preventative measures in, in place. And we recognise as well that this is very much a complex jigsaw and that, uh, as uh, has been said before, that since 2008 there have been quite a significant number of reforms in the financial services area and additional powers given to the central bank in order to monitor to what extent activities that are being carried out now by banks are 
prohibited by law. And if we go back to something like the, the, um, the uh, situation that arose before 2008, it was quite clear from the analysis that the Commission did that there were two issues there. One was that the uh, regulator was operating under what was called a principles approach to regulation, which was in effect light touch regulation. And then the resources that the central bank had were very limited in terms of being able to even use the powers that they did have. So th those are certain things in relation to whether the system is effective, the resourcing of that system and the capacity to actually implement those powers as well in practice. So from, from that point of view, we would say that the reforms that have already been enacted and the proposals that are being made in terms of gap filling of the powers of regulators, uh, we would certainly say that um, in terms of effectiveness, and I, I appreciate that, say for example in the tracker mortgage scandal, uh, that there are a lot of people who are very unhappy about the length of time that it's taken to address that. But equally, the, actually the central bank could not have put in place uh, the examination that it did and the requirement to enter into a tracker mortgage um, uh, redress scheme for consumers uh, and pay them back the money that had been taken from them. That would not have been possible if the central bank was just going into banks and saying, well, morally you should be paying this money back. The central bank had to be able to say to them, there are breaches here of the legislation that have actually occurred. There are potentially offences that have been committed. If you don't pay this money back, then other powers can yeah. be used. So yeah. in, the, in that context, mm -hmm. uh, those regulatory powers have been uh, applied and put into place. The question is to what extent there should be individual accountability in terms of criminal prosecutions. That, of course, is very important. But we now have examples, which we never had in the past, um, of situations where very senior people, including chief executive officers, have been prosecuted and convicted. The cost of those prosecutions, of course, are very high. By comparison, uh, I think what the international literature shows us as well is that the regulatory powers and having um, a very clearly well-resourced financial regulator now in the central bank and including the proposals that the central bank has itself made in terms of the senior manager accountability offence that it proposed in its report uh, last year. Again, we don't address that in, in our report because the central bank had already made that proposal. And all of those different elements of that jigsaw, including what we would see as the need to tidy up the issue of corporate and senior manager liability as a general principle, that all of those different elements uh, are very important from a preventative point of view. They might not guarantee that the kinds of collapse that occurred previously would happen, but certainly in terms of resourcing and giving effective powers and the literature that the Commission has looked at internationally shows that those kinds of powers like financial sanctions and being able to require um, regulatory settlements to be entered into, those are extremely important and quite effective and from a, um, a citizen's point of view, possibly the most um, efficient methods of ensuring that the redress is actually given. So you think financial sanctions are adequate to prevent this happening again? We're also saying that that's one part of the puzzle mm -hmm. and then the second part of the puzzle is tidying up the rules about corporate mm -hmm. and senior management responsibility because in fact, as the Commission's analysis shows, one of the problems at the moment with corporate criminal liability is that the rules that appear to apply uh, would be rules which uh, would make it almost impossible to convict a big mm -hmm. corporate entity of any serious crime um, whereas the proposals that the Commission are making are ones which would say that there ought to be a system in which that so-called paradox of size where small corporate entities have been prosecuted and convicted in the past, but ironically we haven't prosecuted uh, large corporate entities. Yeah, the, the I know, individuals I know what have you're saying. Yeah, I'm still not uh, con convinced until there's individual accountability uh, and real accountability and there's... Um, uh, there is other than financial sanctions put in place that really yes. we will get the results uh, that we need. Out of you know, so the convictions that have happened and all of that, how many of those have been jailed? There have been a number of jail terms imposed uh, in relation to the trials that took place between 2014 and 2018. So those jail terms ranged from, there were some community service 
um, uh, sanctions imposed, but the jail terms range from two years to, um, I think, six years. How many uh, individuals were there? Again, just remind me. It, it would be uh, the separate individuals would be in the order of five or six, I think, from mm. from recollection. Mm. Um, but a, again, I suppose from from that point of view. Uh, in, in terms of our history of, of prosecutions, there is no doubt that um, that number of prosecutions are five or six more than would have been the case in, in the past. And uh, again, in, in the report, we look at the history of... Yeah, I know, I know what you're saying, but I think we need to look to the future, we need to look to the present, and we need to look to our attitude to white-collar crime. And I don't, I, I know where you're going with this and what you're saying. I cannot share your confidence that we are where we need to be at, at, at this particular time. But I want to ask you a couple of other questions just around the, the multi party actions. And I don't see in your proposal um, anywhere around the class action or multi party actions as you say, you know, the likes of which you get in, in America. So again, if we're looking at, and you refer to the tracker uh, mortgage scandal and the overcharging scandals, um, there would seem to be an overwhelming logic uh, to put in place uh, a facility for class action uh, where ordinary victims can work together um, and have strength in numbers that are necessary to face an institution. Why was that? Why did... You, did you look at that, and why isn't it there? Well, well uh, the, the Commission published a report on this in 2005, um, and we're uh, very pleased to see, in fact, that a private member's bill um, has proposed that that report be implemented. Um, and I understand that that has perhaps passed second stage, I think. Um, uh, so I, I think uh, the, the Commission certainly recommended that there ought to be a version of the uh, collective action, the class action, uh, put in place, um, and that would be why we didn't deal with that in, in, this, in this report. Uh, but certainly the Commission in its 2005 report recommended that that is something that, that can be used. But I think, again, in a sense, to complement that, um, you, you would certainly look at the kind of approach that was taken in the tracker mortgage instance where, in effect, you had a, the regulator imposing results for a very large group of people that might very well have been done through a class action. Um, and not that I would want to in any way denigrate a, a class action, but those are very complex um, pieces of litigation to put together. So I, I certainly wouldn't say that uh, uh, class actions are not part of that overall measure, but it was certainly dealt with by the Commission in a separate report. And so, of course, it is always a matter for the Oireachtas to decide whether to implement that. So I, I'm conscious that there is a private member's bill uh, proposing that. And certainly we would be one of the few countries in Europe that doesn't have that kind of collective redress mechanism, um, but ag again, it can complement the kind of redress that has actually been achieved for a very large group of people in the, in the tracker mortgage um, examination. Yeah, so you would think it was important uh, to have that there. Now, in terms of the corporate uh, crime agency, a lot of people might see the corporate crime agency as just another quango. You know, we have the Central Bank, we have the Competition and Consumers Protection Commission, we have the ODCE, um, and we have the heads of bills from government establishing uh, a corporate enforcement authority. Um, which some would see again as rebranding uh, the ODCE by government. What consideration did you, do you give to beefing up the existing bodies rather than creating a new one? Yeah, we certainly uh, looked at that and there's no doubt that in many of the areas that have uh, previously led to prosecutions, all of those agencies, the Central Bank, the ODCE, of course the Garda Shia Khan in terms of looking at very serious issues, uh, that they have uh, been involved in uh, all of those activities. I think one of the things that the Commission looked at was to what extent we could have a, an umbrella organisation that would bring together in under a single um, roof uh, the expertise that is necessary in order to investigate very serious corporate uh, crime, and in particular um, that falls outside of the scope of the very important powers that regulators such as the Central Bank and uh, the Competition okay. Commission have. So 
I, I think in, in consulting with them, uh, they would recognise that their powers uh, are focused on particular areas and perhaps there's a need for uh, a, an entity that would bring together all the investigative powers um, and the kind of forensic analysis under one roof um, uh, and that that would complement uh, the kinds of activities that the different organisations were done in the same way as, of course, you know, in, before the Criminal Assets Bureau was established, there were different entities that were looking at those kinds of issues around proceeds of crime. But having established a single entity with a multidisciplinary group of people who had that focus, that has really made an enormous difference. Um, and so definitely um, much better than the sum of its parts. Uh, that might have been in place before that. So from that perspective, I think that was really the analysis that the Commission arrived at in, in making that recommendation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Okay. Um, Senator Burke. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Chairman. I'd like to welcome the delegation and thank them for the submission that they have made. Could I just ask, in relation to where would you draw the line, we'll say, between reckless lending and reckless borrowing? Or is there, is there such a thing as a reckless borrowing? reckless borrower. Um, uh, there's no doubt uh, that I'm, I'm sure people uh, have borrowed and uh, regretted that, so there may very well be that. I think the focus of the Commission is on those who create the context within which uh, the activity has actually taken place. So uh, our focus certainly was on those corporate entities uh, engaging in activities, whether it's uh, through lending or through the accounts that they might be publishing for people to examine and make decisions about whether to invest in those entities. The focus there was on the corporate entity uh, in terms of it having a lot more control over what was going on rather than the person who might be receiving that. Now I appreciate that that, was, uh, that is certainly a debate that has been going on in terms of the extent to which uh, those who borrowed uh, engage in activity that would be regarded as either careless uh, or uh, reckless. But in a sense, I think, uh, in terms of the analysis of um, reckless borrowing, I think those are matters which are better left to uh, civil law disputes about whether the contract is enforceable or not. And our focus was certainly on those who are engaged in the lending activity. So you, have more, you put more weight on the, on the lender rather than, than the borrower? Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, in relation to the corporate entity, uh, we'll say if you have a, a small restaurant or a hotel or whatever and, and you're in breach of uh, guidelines for food or whatever, you're closed down for, until you get everything right. Would you not think that it would be better in relation to the corporate entity or the bank or the in banking institution that you should recommend that they would be closed for a week or two weeks or a month rather than a big fine of 10 million. 10 million is the, is the maximum fine that you can have at the moment anyway. So 10 million is very little to some of those banks. So would you not say it would be more appropriate we were to close you down? And then at least everybody would know that there was a crime committed or that there was a breach committed. Whereas when you uh, have a big fine, you can ask anybody in the street, and they, even if it was 10 million of a fine, and I don't think we have seen 10 million of a fine yet, have we? Nobody, nobody knows about it. But they'd certainly know if their bank was closed for a period of a week or two weeks. Or... Well, certainly that, um, there the was such a provision under the Intoxicating Liquor Act, I think, uh, I think it still exists, uh, for serving underage, uh, for people who, who, when pubs were found serving uh, drink to persons underage, there was a requirement there that the pub would close for a certain number of days and that they had to put a notice on the door to that effect. So effectively what you're talking about there, Senator, is, if you like, I suppose, the penalties, uh, you know, the penalty once uh, a company or indeed whatever the enterprise might be had been found guilty of a specific offence. And I suppose what you're asking is, would it be a more effective penalty if they had to close and do so publicly? And yes, I suppose that's certainly, uh, it, 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 we weren't really getting into penalties uh, in this particular report. And uh, as you say, um, and, and we were more concerned, I suppose, with large scale corporate crime. But I wouldn't for a moment diminish the importance of, um, let's say, hotels or guest houses, restaurants or whatever, uh, which are usually incorporated, uh, engaging in uh, crime that might harm individuals by.
uh, you know, having uh, not, a, not, not abiding by health and safety rules or by hygiene rules or whatever, which are very, very important, and the breach of those rules can cause considerable harm to individuals. So, yes, I mean, that is the kind of thing that could certainly be considered in, in a broader context of how to penalise, if you like, uh, certain kinds of regulatory breaches. But would you put it into the report? Uh, no, well, I suppose I didn't put it into our report because essentially we were more concerned here with um, the structure, if you like, of corporate regulation and also looking at the definitions of offences. Um, but um, in any event, I mean, the courts already have considerable general powers in that regard. But when it comes to, let's say, making closure orders, uh, they would require specific statutory powers. As I say, they have them in some situations, they have that power in some circumstances already. So perhaps, in a sense, it would be a question of extending them uh, to, other, uh, to other kinds of violations. Yeah, um, Sorry, if I, if I yeah. just add very briefly on that. Uh, one of the issues that we certainly um, uh, emphasise is that our, 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 we wouldn't have a role in terms of determining what the policy of a regulator should be in terms of, for example, a licensing of a bank and whether that licence should be taken away or not. Uh, there's no doubt that that is something that is included in the central bank legislation. So it is possible uh, for the central bank to revoke a banker's licence, and that would be in terms of how we described it in the, uh, in, in the report um, as you know, the top of the pyramid, in fact, of the enforcement sanctions. That is certainly an option that is open uh, to, to the central bank. So from that point of view, uh, we weren't looking at that because that, that was outside of our remit. Yes, so that's uh, really the well, policy. Know, uh, at the uh, yes, bank. and the, the central bank have revoked some of the licences. But yes. uh, for us as legislators, uh, you could make a recommendation in the report to say, well, you could include this in the, in, in the legislation to say that maybe an institution should be closed for a period of time if it's yes. a breach, yeah, yeah. A breach of the, the laws. So you'd be in favour of that. Um, well, we didn't consider Just that, okay, so I suppose consideration. Yeah. And, and I don't want to put me on the spot. Like, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's entirely a matter for uh, 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 the committee and the Iraq to decide right. how to improve the report. And we, we certainly know that from all of the analysis that's done on our reports, uh, including most recently the, the report on, on consumer insurance, we've seen from the detailed scrutiny that you've uh, done there that there are improvements that can be made in any of the recommendations that the, the Commission make. So, uh, again, bearing in mind that uh, it was probably one of the most wide-ranging reports and examinations that we carried out, and we were very conscious that we didn't have the capacity to decide what ought to be regulatory policy as such. What we were looking at was whether there were gaps in some of the powers that the regulators have, and and that was certainly, you know, the, the, the central bank already had that kind of power to revoke a licence. So what the policy of the bank might be in a particular situation and what factors would be taken into account in deciding whether to shut a bank for a short period of time or to completely revoke its licence, those would be very much uh, that kind of uh, regulatory policy issues that we really would not feel uh, that we'd have the capacity okay. to analyse that. Uh, it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I suppose if I just add to that just, just briefly, um, in terms of, um, uh, it, it gets down to a point I was just making in response to a question from Deputy Doherty, is that perhaps there is a need in some other context to look at the penalties that can be imposed on companies generally, as I say, generally speaking at the moment there are financial penalties, they may or may not be effective, so sometimes there may be uh, a case for or there is probably a case for looking more generally at what are the appropriate, what is the appropriate range of penalties to impose on companies, um, and perhaps, uh, if you like, imposing the death penalty in some cases might well be an appropriate one. So in, the, in the case of the death penalty, it, if somebody carried it, carried out the, the crime, it wasn't the four walls of the bank or whatever, and yeah. you know I would have uh, problems with. Uh, penalties for the, the corporate entity because you're, it's a, four walls of a bank or four walls of an institution that's committed the crime, and you'd wonder how how the institution can commit commit the crime. It's uh, it's obviously somebody working there that yeah. that commits the crime, and that leads me to the point there where you you have said that you could that procedures should be put in place, uh, um, and uh, that if the body corporate has its has structures in place that it would help, uh, it would help in, in uh, uh, alleviating, I suppose, the problems where 
where uh, crimes are, are committed or where there's reckless uh, lending or reckless trading taking place. So would you not think that the, if the, uh, these structures are in place uh, and if somebody breaches the... You know, what you're saying is if these structures are in place and if there's a breach, then there is a crime against the individual or against the entity, corporate entity? In, in both those instances, there, there are, as Commissioner O'Malley has said, there are different approaches. Obviously, the, the corporate entity, the four uh, walls, as, as you say, can't be jailed. That, that, that is one thing. Um, and then, um, in terms of the penalties that might be imposed, they can range from, if it is a licensing system, that the top of the range penalty would be a licensing uh, revocation. In the proposals that we make in terms of uh, regulatory enforcement uh, agreements or settlements, what we've certainly said there is that the range of penalties and approaches can, that can, can be taken there can be quite wide-ranging for the regulator, so that they can include the consumer redress schemes that we've seen in the tracker mortgage uh, scandal. They can also include situations where there would be a requirement imposed on uh, the entity and including the senior managers to engage in reformed procedures in order to ensure that what has uh, been identified as a problem is, as so far as possible, not repeated into the future. So the regulators have that capacity, and we certainly recommend that the full range of that capacity should be explored by a regulator in deciding, well, if this entity is capable of being rescued in that sense of being able to comply, that there are various steps that the regulator can oversee and ensure that they're implemented into the future to fix the problem. And that can sometimes involve uh, either retraining people or giving people the competence uh, to show that they're able to comply and that, for example, the risk management is appropriate in terms of the uh, corporate governance that requirements that might be in place uh, from uh, the uh, regulator. Yeah, you see, there is a certain amount of risk management in place as it is, but one of the problems that we have here at the, in this committee, and I suppose one of the best contributions that was made here at this committee was by a man called Jonathan Sugarman. And I asked him what his job was, and he, he likened his job to that he was in charge of the cash register. And he, uh, every evening he had to have enough of money in the cash register to pay everybody. And if he hadn't, he had to go to the central bank or to the parent body to get the money to put into the cash register to pay everybody. Yes. And he left his job uh, one evening with a letter for the central bank and handed it in to them to say that he, he was having problems. And nothing happened. The only thing that did happen, we know, is that he lost his job and he's unemployable since. And there was a certain amount of regulations uh, and um, structures in place for something to happen at that stage, but nothing happened. So can we take it that if all of these new uh, proposals that you have will be put in place, that we won't have a Jonathan Sugarman in the future? I, I don't think anybody can guarantee that, but I, I think we're also very conscious that those who do raise issues, um, th that is certainly a, a challenge, and we've seen that in many different contexts, uh, where somebody is making a protected disclosure, uh, that that does create challenges, but at least uh, in the context of the legislation, insofar as it can provide protection, that, that protection is, is there. So I, I don't think any of us can guarantee that that would be um, a solution to all of the, the problems, but at least there is a structure in place, uh, uh, and, and perhaps that does need to be improved. But uh, again, I would say that the issue around protected disclosures is, is a separate issue on which, obviously, the Oireachtas has um, uh, put in place very clear um, uh, legislation for lots of different contexts. Yeah. Uh, finally, Chairman, just in relation to you say that there has to be, uh, for recklessness to be, uh, uh, for it to be an offence of recklessness, that there has to be a potential gain. And, uh, you know, ha has, has there a trade has to be carried out? It cannot be just talk. We'll say, we we'll talk about getting a loan or giving a loan. So there, there has to be, it has to be more than the intent has it. it, it particularly if it has to go to higher up the ladder to the board or whatever for approval. Unless, if it doesn't, have approval, if it has to have approval from some other place, is, is it described as recklessness 
at the bottom, we'll say, at that stage, if you know what I mean. Well, well certainly, that particular offence is about the potential for making a gain for, if you like, the person who's um, going to make the gain, or creating the potential for a loss to yeah. the person to whom it might be a loss. So, yes, and, and again, there are... But, it, but if it has to go for approval for the board, uh, the board can refuse or agree, is it still described as, as recklessness? Well, I, I think in, in that context, then, we're into a, a, a slightly different area of law, yeah. which is around what, what, how far does somebody have to go in order to either conspire to commit an offence or attempt an offence or incite an offence. So, again, there are separate <coughs> rules uh, around that um, on which the Commission has made recommendations in, in okay. the past. Uh, but th that would be a separate area. How far do you have to go in order to commit a so-called incomplete or inchoate offence? Right. You should take, you should, the answer is that you have to take some step, some definite step towards doing so. In other words, just forming the intention to do so isn't sufficient, that you have to take some positive step towards achieving the completed offence. But it's very much a kind of a fact-specific situation and that it's very difficult to kind of uh, say in advance exactly what would be sufficient to constitute an attempt and what wouldn't. You have to look at kind of the, the, total, the total set of facts that are involved. You know. Okay, thanks, Chairman. Um, I think it's fair to say that for most people in this House, um, they turn to the professionals in relation to the law because it's intricate and it's complex and it relies on all sorts of um, older laws to, to uh, define the newer law or vice versa. And uh, on the committee here, in terms of our work, we come face to face with the failure of that law a lot of the time um, and we, we wonder why and how can we better uh, the law that we have. So therefore the work of the Commission is hugely uh, important because you are the, the information piece for us uh, to inform us and so on. So this exchange here today is the opportunity for us I suppose to to test the layman's view of this against the Commission and its view of the law. So if I take the point raised by Senator Burke, which was about Jonathan Sugarman, and we can mention his name because it's been publicly aired here at this meeting, he abided by the law. He said, the law is such, and I am obliged to go to the central bank and to tell them. And he did. Now, had he been listened to, we might have had a different outcome. We can't say that we would have had, but we might have had. Because the biggest law that was broken in this country was that the 65 billion euro of taxpayers' money had to be put in to rescue the banks, or, you know, thereabouts. <clears throat> and arising from that, the people of the country were forced into poverty, a lot of them, uh, forced into legal exchanges with the banks in terms of saving their properties, which they thought they would never have to do. So when you look at Jonathan Sugarman and what happened, and we're not getting specifically into his case, <clears throat> but when we pursued the central bank on it, they said that by law they couldn't tell us what actually happened, if anything happened, to the complaint made by Jonathan Sugarman. So as a measure, as a step, I would say, take that law and change it. Allow the central bank to name and shame in the context of the outcome of uh, a complaint process against the bank. That's the first thing that I would say. So that's a simple thing, I think. Maybe it's not so simple when you guys get at it, but you know, it's simple enough from a layman's perspective and it gives transparency and all the rest of it. Then I would say to you, well, the guards, for example, the law says that once the guardy have an investigation, that this house here can't <coughs> discuss the particulars of that investigation, maybe investigation about the, uh, how public money was spent. So as soon as the agency that's been accused 
or a government department, HSE or whatever it might be, and it's, the investigation is undertaken here, all they have to do is inform the guards. And once they inform the guards, game over. We can't pursue our work. So I think the law has to be changed in relation to the aspect of um, giving public information about issues relative to investigations or the investigations themselves, to give some sort of comfort to the people involved that the investigations are ongoing, we know about them, we are conducting them, and there will be an outcome. One issue that was being dealt with by the Public Accounts Committee has gone on for 15 years. We're told it's being investigated. I have no idea whether it's being investigated or not. Uh, and I think that that's unfair. And they say that that's because of the law. The, the law says that, you know, we're investigating, we can't tell you anything. Now, this, this all feeds into the perception that the public have about, you know, the, 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 the mainstay of the state, be it the Dáil, the Senate, the Guards, whatever it might be. And it's creating a difficulty, uh, and respect is being damaged. And I'm suggesting that these minor things might change it. So the other aspect I look at is accountants and their profession. They're all, uh, you know, they, you'll see the, their titles after their names. You'll see that they're members of, of uh, certain organisations to give themselves some standing. That they're, they're okay, they're members of an organisation. You'll see the same with solicitors and barristers. And they're members of these groups that give them a particular standing and give comfort to the client. But what happens when the legal representative and the accountant come together with the client who relies solely on them? And they go to the bank manager and they ask for a loan. And they misrepresent the figures in order to attain the biggest loan possible. And some of these then customers are, they complain to these organisations, the barristers, the solicitors, the accountants, and nothing ever happens. The number of farmers that are now saying to us, well, we went in <coughs> and we wanted to get half a million, wherever it might have been, for their milk and parlour, and they put forward the cost of a, a litre of milk at, say, 29 cents. But the bank and the accountant said to them, well, look, that won't work for you, but if, you, if we can use a figure of 35 cents or 40 cents a litre, you might actually get your half a million. So that's not a victimless crime. There is a victim, and the victim is the client applying for the money. And nobody can understand why, when that's exposed, that no one is held to account over it. So there must be a law in there somewhere that needs to be tightened, needs to be updated, or whatever. Same way with the trackers, Deputy Doherty uh, said about the trackers. Um, you know, the banks must think that we are all really naive to believe that on the same day, in every bank, the decision was made about trackers. It's it just, just coincidence. So I think that these are the laws that have to be, whatever laws are there controlling all of this, that have to be um, modernised, recognising you know, the fact that people are given an incentive, actually, to give out money, ignore real figures, uh, be dishonest, um, knowing full well that they will all get paid, but the, the victim at the end of it, which is the customer, will actually have to carry the can. So is there not a way of looking at all of these laws, <coughs> not in isolation, but how they impact on the perception of the general public, how it, these laws need to be tightened and modernised for our times? Because I would contend that a lot of what happened in the banking crisis is now beginning to happen again. And no one seems to mind. Well, uh, Chair, um, of course, you, you've asked us to address um, some very big 
questions there. The, the Commission, uh, in terms uh, of its statutory uh, remit, is limited in some respects to uh, programmes of reform that we prepare from time to time, and therefore uh, those would be the focus of our uh, examinations. Um, and, and, and those are programmes that are presented to uh, uh, the uh, Rockless Justice Committee. In, in fact, the uh, Rockless Justice Committee examined our next programme of law reform um, and uh, approved it. And so, to <coughs> some extent, we're limited in terms of what we can examine by the, the, those uh, programmes. So, I, I'm not saying that. Um, can, can I answer, Mr. Burns? Sorry, yes, of course. Do you think that that in itself is an outdated method of doing business? where you're given a remit, and if you felt that the remit wasn't wide enough to allow you to do what is necessary in the face of all of this carry on, yes. that, that you, within what you do, would say to the Minister, you're proposing, or the committee, whoever is proposing this body of work, we think that this should be included as well. Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly do that. I mean, we consult on what is possible to do within the, um, the limits of our resources uh, and then also in terms of what uh, people who've made submissions to us uh, uh, suggest. But if, if I can actually turn to some of the points that you've made, for example, about the issue around naming and shaming, in all of the recommendations that we've made here in relation to uh, things like the um, financial sanctions, that would be imposed by regulators, we are very clear in saying that must involve a public statement of the detail of that and naming the entity that would be included. And we're very conscious that that issue of transparency and publicity in terms of the proposals that we're making here uh, across the, all of the range of powers that we're proposing need publicity, need the oxygen of publicity. And so we're, we're absolutely committed to that in terms of our recommendations. Uh, we, we don't exclude in any of the work that we do, we don't exclude the possibility that we would identify work that needs to be done uh, in addition to some of the recommendations okay. that we make. And often in the consultations that we get after we've published our initial consultative document, and if somebody raises an issue that uh, perhaps we haven't <coughs> identified in our initial document, then we would make those proposals. And certainly in the, in the past, in terms of the regulation of those who are giving advice on debt, and where people have fallen into debt. We recommended in our report that uh, uh, was implemented in the Personal Insolvency Act of 2012 uh, that uh, those people who are giving advice uh, on debt need to be regulated. So again, we, we would be very clear uh, th there may very well be deficiencies in, in regulation, and I, I think we're very conscious of that in the context of the lead-up to the, uh, the banking crash, that there were issues there around poor regulation, poor internal governance in banks. Those have already been identified, including in the, the, the banking inquiry. Um, so from that point of view, we wouldn't be in any way complacent about um, regulation, but we would say in any of the recommendations that we make, in, and also including in terms of the proposal on deferred prosecution agreements, that in the United States these can be done privately in effect, a deal that's done privately with a prosecutor in the States, with a dis district attorney in the States. We think that that would be unacceptable, that is unacceptable, and that the only proposal that we would be making would be one that would be uh, in court, openly, where all the terms and conditions have to be approved by, uh, by a judge. So again, in, in any of the recommendations that we make, if you want to take uh, that approach, we certainly would fully approve of anything that would involve um, uh, the uh, publication of any of the arrangements that, that would be put in place. So we would certainly be uh, in favour of that. In terms of issues around what can or can't be said about um, pending investigations, uh, as it happens, the Commission uh, uh, under the presidency of, of Judge Lafoy is, is examining the issue of contempt of court and what are the, um, what's the scope of, of that law. So we certainly would understand a need for um, reform and recommendations in that area, and that is something on which the Commission is currently uh, conducting um, uh, an in inquiry as to reform of the law. So I think certainly the comments that you've made today are uh, aspects that we will certainly um, uh, incorporate into our discussion of that, that particular area of law. And, and the other 
just two points I would make is that even in relation to uh, the law and how it works around the work of public representatives or the parliament, I think that you should not be afraid to go there either. Um, because we have the, I know that the, the separation of powers and I accept all of that. But if we can't exchange views between one another as to how you know, both of those powers operate and how, how, how they might operate better for people that we represent, then how can we make the law better? Uh, and I don't mean an open public forum where we challenge each other, but there has to be a sensible, and maybe you're the body to look at it and say, look, this is the way you should do your work, or this is the, the law that needs to be changed. And I, and I would welcome that. And the second point, and last point I would make, is that in the context of regulators, those that regulate their own profession, solicitors, barristers, or, or accountants, or the regulator of bank, a bank, or any other regulator, regardless of what happened back in 2008, and regardless of what resources they had or law they had, it wouldn't have cost them a cent to put their hand up and say, stop, there is something wrong here. And they didn't do it. And nobody gets penalised for it that I have seen. Nobody. And that is what is sad about the laws in the country. It would appear, and our constituents would tell us this, that the law is for them, but is not for those up there, some elite, as they might describe them. Uh, and I would like to see a lot more done in relation to that. And we mentioned protected disclosures, and I'll just finish on this. The protected disclosure legislation was great, but isn't it amazing that in most of the cases of whistleblowers, they will tell you, I'm sorry I came forward. And I think that the law has to be strengthened to the extent that that is not the case. If we can't learn from our mistakes, we learn nothing. And I think that all of that you know, rests to a degree on your shoulders. Um, mention was made of financial fines and all the rest of it. And it turns out that the bank does something wrong or something else, so there's a fine. So the customers pay for it anyway. And it was probably the customer that was sinned against in the first place. Um, and, and anyway, just to, to wind up, if you'd like to say anything more to the members, Deputy Darty. Yeah, can I just with just a quick uh, question as well, and, and, and thanks again for your attendance at, at committee and, and the invaluable um, proposals that you put before us. I, I just want your view on on on. on well, on two issues in particular, I won't go into, I think it was an interesting discussion in relation to banks and their licences, and we know that banks can have their licences revoked at all times, but regardless, the reality is they're still too big to fail, and the consequences of revoking a bank's licence in the morning would be calamity for customers and all the rest, so it's, it's not really a threat, but I, I was interested in what uh, Commissioner O'Malley had to say in relation to uh, some of the other penalties outside of financial. But the two questions I have in relation to you is, you, you propose in relation to prosecution in terms of a unit within them. In the States, they have a special prosecutor. You know, when something happens of a large nature, there may be a special prosecutor to investigate. Is there a need for a special prosecutor or a regime of that nature to deal with issues of, you know, potential future financial scandals uh, if they were to appear, or, or white-collar crime. Um, is, that, is that the area that we should be, be going into? And the second question I have is in relation to the chairperson spoke about whistleblowers and spoke about Jonathan Sugarman, and we've uh, raised this on numerous occasions in this committee. Um, but we see, again, and, you know, my frustration with the tracker scandal is, like I've always said, that it probably will end up in courts and whatever about the central bank and, the, and, and, and how the number of people who have been redressed. We have the situation, I just got figures um, yesterday, 1,200 people who went through that system are with the ombudsman now. They feel that they've been failed by the central banks and the individual banks and the regime that they've put together. And I have no doubt um, that when the ombudsman is completed with this, that a number of them will be going to court. Um, and we're familiar with cases, for example, the Bank of Ireland employees uh, who are completely shafted by their own bank and indeed left high and dry by the, the regulator and the central bank in relation to this. Um, so 
class action is, is, is important. But in terms of accountability, I've always, I've always been of this view that unless you really get whistleblowers within the financial institution, unless you get somebody to squeal or speak up, then it's very difficult to prosecute. And does the Law Reform Commission, or have you looked at it as part of your, uh, your, your, your body of work that you've done in relation to the whistleblower reward scheme that has been considered by Britain, is in place in America, and there's critique in relation to this as well, but some quite interesting results, particularly recently, and some very, very high awards uh, for whistleblowers who are able to retain or who get paid a portion of the amount that is recovered by the financial institution. I think recently there was a whistleblower who was uh, awarded 30 million, which gives you the example of uh, the amount that they're able to on that on the information. And actually, quite recently, there was another whistleblower who refused the eight and a half million dollars uh, that was awarded to them for the SEC, and instead asked that it would be given to the shareholders of the financial institution. So it's not always that the incentive is the reason to do it, but indeed in that case, the individual actually said the incentive was one of the reasons why they came forward, uh, but believed that the, um, the sanction was still too light. Anyway, sorry, that went off on a wee bit of tangent, but just is there a role in your view for this type of whistleblower reward scheme to be introduced in relation to financial uh, criminality uh, and financial inappropriate conduct? Is that something that you looked at? Well, um, your first question, Deputy, I think was about the special prosecutor. Yes. Is that right? Um, well, I mean, we, we certainly discussed the whole question of the allocation of prosecution functions while we were drawing up the report. In America, for example, as I say, they do have this uh, concept of the special prosecutor, usually, however, in a more political context, uh, such as when a senior p politician, including perhaps the president, is being uh, under investigation. Uh, when it comes, let's say, to white-collar crime and corporate crime, generally speaking, they wouldn't necessarily have special prosecutors, but they do have, if you like, areas or prosecutors that are specialised in the field. For example, an awful lot of white-collar crime and corporate crime is prosecuted in the Southern District of New York, because that's where a lot of the big financial districts uh, are located. And therefore, both the prosecutors and the judges uh, who operate in that particular area have tremendous expertise in areas, for example, like insider trading, and those areas which are very, very complicated and so forth. Um, as for, uh, translating that then into this country, I think one of the things we have to realise is that the real problem is not so much questions of prosecution, it's very often the question of investigation, that the collection of the investigation of these offences, as we saw with the banking cases, for example, uh, both the investigation of them, the enormous amount of documentation that will be assembled uh, as a result of those investigations, which could run literally to millions of pages of documents, it's going to take time either way. And therefore, what I would suggest um, is that, and would accept absolutely fully, as I think all the law enforcement agencies of this country would, is that you do need specialisation in the field. And, uh, but I think that uh, under the Constitution, um, it is possible uh, to have a prosecutor other than the Director of Public Prosecutions, Article 30, would provide for that. But I think that given the scale with which we're operating, Given the fact that, uh, I hope I'm not being too optimistic, you know, that the number of large-scale of, of, of large offences of this nature that will have to be prosecuted will probably be rather small, I think it is far better to stay with the Director of Public Prosecutions, because their office have, you know, an enormous amount of expertise right across the board. And I think that what experience has shown is it's all very well sometimes to talk about um, appointing special prosecutors, but it's a very specialised uh, area in itself, and you do need experienced people. And therefore, I think the better idea is to, for the moment at least, to leave, it, to leave the prosecution of serious offences within the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. They have a specialised section within it to deal with this area, but it may need further resources uh, as time goes by in order to uh, deal with more of those offences. I have to say in relation to your second question, um, I don't think it's one that we had thought of in the course of our deliberations, the idea of rewarding people for uh, being whistleblowers. Um, it's obviously something, as you can appreciate, that has to be treated with great care. 
uh, in order to ensure that it doesn't give rise to, uh, I mean, if, when you start giving people big money for doing that kind of thing, the temptation to do wrong and to make false allegations and so forth can be very high indeed. So therefore, um, I would think perhaps uh, if there were to be some reward, and I wouldn't, I, I'm talking purely off the top of my head, I'm certainly not speaking on behalf of the Commission very much in a personal capacity, I wouldn't have any kind of uh, moral objection to it, but I would be very anxious that the rewards would be kept very modest because I don't think that it should be at a stage where they would provide the temptation <laughs> to engage in, uh, in what might be false allegations. <clears throat> Maybe the better step would be to protect the whistleblower. Uh, sorry, Chairman? The better step would be to protect yes. the whistleblower <laughs> to a great, far greater extent. Yeah. Uh, so the meeting is now adjourned, uh, Sinead Day, and thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman.